Welcome to the Biblical Game of Thrones. It's 1100 BCE. The 12 tribes of Israel have settled the Promised Land, but have split into two separate, though closely related, nations. In the south are the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. In the north are the 10 remaining tribes. The 10 northern tribes are known simply as Israel, and the two southern tribes are called the Nation of Judah. At this point, both Israel and Judah are under constant attack by the nations that surround them, and both live under the thumb of the Philistines. As separate nations, with 12 tribes between them, they're too disorganized and weak to fight back. They ask Samuel, a great prophet and the last of the judge chieftains, to appoint a king to rule over them. This shift in government creates a kingdom whose influence still reverberates in the world today. When Jews pray for a return to the days of old, these are the days they're referring to. While the impact of the United Monarchy on human history is immeasurable, by itself, it lasted all of 80 years. Samuel is hesitant to appoint a king to rule over the Israelites. After all, only God is supposed to be the king of Israel, right? But according to the book of Samuel 1, God tells him, heed their demand and appoint a king for them. Okay then. Samuel anoints Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. Tall Saul stands a head above his brothers, and he's not too sure about taking the job. The Israelites are not too sure about him either, but then Saul proves himself in battle. He successfully defends the Israelites from the enemies who surround them and pushes back the Philistines. Now the people celebrate. They publicly inaugurate Saul and declare him the king of both Judah and Israel. The young king starts off strong, but the good times don't last. God commands Samuel to have King Saul wipe out the Amalekites. The Amalekites in Israel have been enemies ever since the Amalekites attacked the vulnerable nation as it wandered through the Sinai en route to the Promised Land. And in Samuel's day, King Agag of the Amalekites was infamous for killing women and children in battle. This was an evil man leading an evil people. God gives Samuel the order to eradicate them completely. No soldier is to derive any benefit from the victory. Samuel then communicates this to Saul, and Saul defeats the Amalekites in battle and fulfills God's command, mostly. He wipes them out, but he gives the best of the Amalekite cattle to his soldiers. And he takes pity on their king, Agag, and disobediently keeps him alive. Samuel is livid. Saul begs Samuel for forgiveness, but Samuel tells Saul, you have rejected the Lord's command, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Samuel then has King Agag brought before him, and he cuts him into pieces. About here is where the narrative turns into a fascinating character study of Saul. Saul does not step down from the throne. Samuel, meanwhile, with God's instruction, anoints the young, ruddy-cheeked, bright-eyed, and handsome David as the next king of Israel. Fearing for David's life, Samuel anoints him in secret. David is now the divinely anointed king of Israel, but only his father and brothers know about it. Saul's mood begins to turn bitter. The spirit of God withdrawn from him, he's taken over by a darker state of mind, which the Bible describes as an evil, tormenting spirit. The court's attendees hire a young harpist to lift Saul's mood. They hire... David. Turns out, he's a very good harpist. The secret king now lives in the court of the disgraced king and plays the harp to calm his nerves, and Saul has no idea. To make matters worse, Saul's daughter Michal falls in love with David, and Saul's son Jonathan becomes David's closest friend. The two young men grow to love each other like brothers. The Philistines, meanwhile, amass for a counterattack. A giant Philistine steps forward. He is a Goliath of a man. In fact, he is Goliath. He challenges Saul's army to champion warfare. No Israelite volunteers to fight this mouth breather until little David steps into the ring. Enormous and well-trained, Goliath is terrifying. People aren't afraid of fighting him because they're worried they're going to look stupid. They're worried they are going to look dead and smushed into the ground. Goliath charges. David palms a rock in his satchel. He loads a sling and lets loose a projectile that strikes Goliath cleanly through the forehead. Goliath collapses face forward into the dirt at David's feet. David then decapitates the fallen giant with Goliath's own sword. Victorious, David holds Goliath's head out before the Philistines who run away in terror. Saul, meanwhile, watches these events with unease. He can't help but wonder how his harpist just managed to fall a ginormous Philistine. He pointedly asks David, who are you? And David answers, son of Jesse from the town of Bethlehem. Pretty much just rank and serial number. Blind with jealousy, Saul puts the untrained David in charge of his army and sends him to the front lines to be killed in battle. Saul tries this again and then again, but every time David returns victorious. In fact, David is becoming pretty popular, while Saul's popularity is waning. 
Soon after, the Philistines organize another massive force and attack the Israelite kingdom. The battle is a rout. Saul's son, Jonathan, is killed along with two of his three brothers. As the battle rages around him, Saul is struck by arrows and knows he won't recover. He falls down on his own sword. Such is the tragic ending of the first king of Israel. A great man and a great leader, and one of the most deeply drawn and troubled personas in all of biblical literature. Finally, the time has come for King David to assume the throne. His men anoint him king of Judah. However, Saul's surviving son, Ishbosheth, declares himself the king of the north, or rather, the king of Israel. A civil war breaks out, and it drags on for years. Slowly, the kingdom of Israel weakens. King David and the kingdom of Judah grow stronger. The kingdom of Israel finally surrenders, and David is anointed both king of Judah and Israel. At last begins the united monarchy. The people have the king that they had hoped for in a united country spanning from north to south. King David takes over a Jebusite stronghold on a hard-to-reach hill, a small fortress town that might already have been known as Jerusalem. He declares it his new capital. He dissociates it from all the tribes so as not to play favorites, and there he builds his city of David. He moves the tabernacle tent and the Ark of the Covenant to the new capital city. It is a glorious celebration. He then attacks and subdues the Philistines and the Moabites. David's army at this point functions almost on autopilot. One summer, his commander tells him that they don't really need him in the field. He can stay home. While idly strolling on the palace roof one day, David sees a woman bathing, and she is very attractive. Her name is Bathsheba. She's the wife of a soldier in David's army, a man named Oria. David invites her over. They sleep together. Then he sends her home. About a month later, she sends him a message. She's pregnant. David hurries to cover his tracks. He repeatedly asks Bathsheba's husband, Oria, to step away from his assigned military post and to spend a night's leave with his wife. Her husband repeatedly refuses. David gives up and tells his chief commander to place Oria at the front of a siege and to leave him there to be killed in battle. When Bathsheba learns that her husband has died, she mourns and then moves to the palace to become David's wife. God is displeased. As punishment, David and Bathsheba's first child dies soon after birth. God also condemns David to live out his days in unrelenting warfare. He tells David that he won't be the one to build God's temple in Jerusalem. His hands will be too soaked in blood. David and Bathsheba have another son, Solomon. David promises Solomon the monarchy. Years later, David is ailing, and Adoniah, David's oldest son, claims to be the next king. Bathsheba reminds David of his promise to Solomon. David has the high priest and the court prophet publicly anoint Solomon and declare him king over all of Israel. When Adoniah hears this, he runs and begs for mercy. Solomon swears to Adoniah that he won't hurt a hair on his head as long as he stays worthy. At 70 years of age and after a 40-year reign, David dies and is buried in the city of David in Jerusalem. And then, Solomon cleans house. Solomon has Adoniah killed, saying, quote, Adoniah shall be put to death this very day. He also kills David's old commander, who had backed Adoniah's illegitimate claim. And he places the priests who had supported Adonia under permanent house arrest. What follows is a long period of political stability that allows for the expansion of the Israelite empire all the way up to the Euphrates in what is now northern Syria. It also allows for the accumulation of great wealth for Solomon and economic well-being for the nation as a whole. And now, according to the book of Kings 1, God tells Solomon that the time has come to start building the temple. The construction of the temple is one of the largest building projects in the ancient world. It takes both the nations of Israel and Tyre to the north to get the job done. The temple takes seven years to build, and that whole time, not a hammer or an axe can be heard on the Temple Mount. The components are finished off-site so that the temple construction itself is completed in reverential silence. Upon completion, it is an architectural masterpiece. One can only imagine the celebration when the Ark of the Covenant is finally installed in the heart of Solomon's newly finished temple. The land of Israel is protected by Solomon's wealth, his might, and his alliances. But more importantly, the laws of the land are fair and just due to Solomon's great wisdom. In fact, for all of his riches and accomplishments, it's his wisdom for which Solomon is most famous, as demonstrated by this one well-known story. In it, two women share a house, each with her own baby. One of the babies tragically dies, and its mother steals the other woman's living infant. The case is brought before Solomon. Standing before the king, each woman claims that the surviving child is hers. Solomon orders a soldier to draw his sword and cut the baby in two. 
He'll give each one of them half a child. One woman says nothing, her jealousy likely placated. But the other screams madly, don't kill the baby, give her the child, let her have the child. Now, knowing who the true mother is, Solomon returns the living baby to her. Among the people of Israel, this story became the great example of Solomon's wisdom. His wisdom can still be witnessed today in his literary achievements. He is credited with the writing of the Song of Songs, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Here, Israel's dream is fully realized. A united kingdom at a time of national safety, a wise and just court system, and a temple within which they could worship God. And then, in old age, Solomon starts to slip. Solomon has a weakness for excess, and it's his wives that lead him astray, all 700 of them. And his 300 concubines probably didn't help matters. As Solomon gets older, he builds temples for his wives so that they can worship their foreign gods. And eventually, Solomon starts worshiping in these temples as well. Displeased with Solomon, God sends him new enemies and Solomon loses control of Damascus. The kingdom of Israel is in retreat. Solomon's death is recorded without fanfare. He ruled for 40 years and is buried in the city of David in Jerusalem beside his father. Upon Solomon's death, the northern kingdom of Israel almost immediately breaks away from the southern kingdom of Judah. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, the king of Judah, now rules over a territory a fraction of the size of his father's kingdom. So ends the United Monarchy, a mere 80 years after it began. As for the 10 northern tribes of Israel, they are eventually conquered by the Assyrian Empire and vanish culturally from the world stage. The monarchies of Judah that followed each have their own storied histories, but they all existed as vassal states under a series of ancient superpowers. The next time the people of Judah, now known as Jews, would rule the land from north to south under their own sovereign power would be almost 3,000 years later, when the modern state of Israel is established in 1948. If you liked this video, please hit that like button, subscribe, and then tap the bell notifications to be alerted when our next video comes out.